I'm going to be talking about evaluating cross-chain messaging protocols, but I think like the more important topic, especially piggybacking on kind of the first two conversations, just building protocols in general in the space. And I think it's both ways. How you look at protocols you're interacting with and how you think about building your own protocols along the way. Um, so the current kind of state of the world of cross-chain messaging, as uh, Naz and Riaz just went through, uh, is a little bit... Uh, hectic in terms of like a lot of a lot of the hacks have kind of revolved around that. You see exponential growth in the protocols themselves. We've gone from all messaging protocols collectively doing tens of thousands of messages per month to single applications doing millions of messages per month, and that's just been in about a year now, right? So um, tremendous, tremendous growth. Uh, proliferation of L2s has only accelerated this, and that's getting crazier with base and ZK sync and like everything else coming out, right? That, that like layer of horizontal composability is expanding rapidly. Um, unfortunately, the same trade-off uh, and how these systems are being built right now is like increasingly centralized systems. So most protocols when it comes to messaging, like I go to this topic of service versus protocol, most of what you're getting from many of them is you're opting into a service, right? There's a third party service. They're not building like a protocol. You're relying on an individual set of actors to basically perform this messaging for you. And if for any reason they fail or they you know, turn malicious or like all of these other things, there's just this vector of one entity that controls it and provides this for you. Um, so you know, like Ali was, was talking about earlier, like there, there is this trade-off where early on those systems will be more performant, uh, but they have a much higher failure rate. And there's a lot of other things that, that go into that. And so right now we often see risk traded for ease. So. When you're evaluating a cross-chain messaging protocol or just any protocol in general and how I think or we think about building protocols, there's really like three things that are, that are fundamental to most things in this space. And it's immutability, permissionlessness, and censorship resistant. Uh, those three things, I think, are the foundation of almost every super successful protocol in the space uh, and really kind of the, the earliest um, catalyst for, for why the space exists in the first part. So first one is easy, immutability. Why, why does it actually matter? So going back to the Nomad hack, um, the Nomad hack has this you know, interesting system. You have optimistic messaging. You have all this stuff that's, that's sort of meant to be this, this security vector in improving how the system works. But at the end of the day, they had the ability to push underlying code, right? So they could update. Uh, the code in the contract at any point in time, which completely changes the spectrum of security that the end user or the application building on top has. So when you talk about like, how do you actually think about evaluating the security of protocol? Like you can do things that give you a better indication early on. So you can get audits, you can have rigorous internal auditing process, you can have external bug bounties to make sure that there are white hat eyes on this, that basically there's, there's been enough time for people to look at it and try to break it and it stood the test of time. But ultimately, if you look at any system in the wild, it's really how much value has been secured and how long has it existed for? Why is Uniswap, you know, as a mechanism seen as so much more secure as a DEX who, who takes liberties and spins up something entirely new, right? It's, it's really because the contracts for Uniswap have been uh, securing tens of billions of dollars for many years now and have never had a security issue, right? They're not upgradable, they can't be changed. Uh, it is a set of things that like exist and everybody knows what they're opting into. And most protocols you see when they launch, TVL grows over time with the most successful. Aave certainly did not launch with $30 billion of TVL. It launched with a small amount, and overall, over time, as it hardens, it increases. And so I think the, the best ad hoc measure is, is simply value secured amount of time. How big of the honeypot has it been, and how long has there been for bad actors or good actors in the case of white hats to come and, and try to basically do this? What has their incentive been? Um, so the issue with immutability is this. Uh, Anytime you upgrade a contract, uh, you basically lose all security. So you have this, you know, billions of dollars secured, it's been around for a year, you're in a great state, you push a change of code that may seem completely benign, uh, and security goes back to effectively zero. And this has been time and time and time again. I actually think in the last six months, we've probably seen four to five major examples of exactly this. And so again, these are like the vector of the validator set is malicious and they're actively trying to exploit you and the crypto economic system has been broken 
that has basically never happened uh, or almost never happened in all of these hacks. What has happened repeatedly is I'm a dev and I want to make an upgrade to the system, so I'm going to push some code. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm just trying to make the system a little bit better, add a new feature, do whatever. You don't necessarily understand all the interactions that that brings. You've missed something. The auditors have missed something. And all of a sudden, everything's gone, right? Um, which was the case in, in the Nomad hack. They pushed something, again, that was extremely benign and just forgot to check uh, for, for the zero address. And then everybody could just repeatedly perform this attack. And so when you have the ability, any, any protocol, especially in messaging, if it has, a pro if it has the ability to upgrade the contracts and the underlying, it will always be an existential risk for the applications building on top. And this is the same way if Uniswap had the ability like, when I talk about immutability, I think Uniswap is, is honestly the gold standard. So when Uniswap migrates from V1 to V2 and V2 to V3, like it is painful and miserable to try to coordinate tens of billions of dollars moving from one contract to another, right? There's this massive social coordination effort. You are now in something that they view as, um, less efficient, possibly less fee efficient for the LPs. Uh, and if they had an easy button that they could press and auto migrate, like 100% they would do that. But if they had the ability to do that, then the relationship they have with the LPs and the underlying stake is, is drastically different, right? Nobody would trust the protocol because they would have the ability to move your LP at any point in time, which means they could effectively have malicious rug, rug your funds. And so the reason it becomes so trusted is that they do not have this ability. And so, yes, when you go V2 to V3, like, V2 still has billions of dollars in it, right? They want everything to be in V3, but they, they don't control it. That's fine. You make a system, and the market sort of decides what the best system is, but the code stands for itself and has stood the test of time um, at scale. And so if we don't accept that in applications that we regularly use, it's crazy to me that that becomes common practice at the messaging level. So again, Almost 95% you know, of messaging protocols today are completely upgradable. They have the ability to change the underlying way that the validation system works, that the contracts do authentication. Um, and that, again, puts every single application at the risk of a completely benign piece of code being moved and the whole security state changing for the application. So I think of, of all things that you can consider, that should be the number one thing is, are the contracts mutable or immutable, and if they are upgradable, like what surface is exposed to me? Um, because even the best developers, like it is very, very, very hard to write good code, let alone perfect code. And so like over a course of time, any good developer will make a mistake at some point in time. And if that can repeatedly change, you're just like you have tail risk and on a long enough time frame that there will always something will always go wrong. So Immutability, I think, is like the number one principle for this. Number two principle, permissionlessness. Um, this is like great examples of this. Well, so obviously, you know, Uniswap, great. Anybody can LP, anybody can trade. The entire system is there's no gatekeeping, there's no whitelisting for who can make a pool on Uniswap, for who can LP. Ethereum is very much like this as well. Anybody can spin up a node, anybody can participate in the network. Uh, there's permissionless application deploy. Anybody can deploy a contract on Ethereum. You don't need to go to the ETH Foundation and ask permission. You don't need to get whitelisted to do anything. Systems today are increasingly sort of bifurcated in, in how they're built along the spectrum. Um, but permissionlessness itself is just another vector of security, right? Ultimately, if there are, uh, so again, I, I'll keep going back to the Nomad case, but like there were the watchers and all optimistic systems are like this, but the watcher set was not permissionless. It's, it's this whitelisted set of watchers where only a certain number of people could. So you had two or three watchers that have the ability to, to go down, to potentially be DDoS. There's, there's all of these complications, and there's reasons why that system was built that way, because it's very hard to make a permissionless set in that and, and still keep liveness. Um, but anytime you don't have permissionlessness, like what you lose in the system is the ability, like TCP IP, like all of that, the ability to have the adoption and the network effects go. You want to create a protocol that has the ability for anybody to participate in, anybody to build on. Uh, and one of the big things is, back to immutability, is like without immutability, permissionlessness doesn't exist. You can always change it, so there's whitelisting. You can always gatekeep. You can always do things. And that itself becomes a huge problem in the next step, which is censorship resistance. Um, 
Because if our principle when building is basically, if you have the ability to censor, it will always be enforced, always. Like even in the most free and open system in the, like possibly the entire world right now, which is effectively Ethereum, um, you look at what the validators have to go through right now in terms of like uh, basically removing blocks and, and doing governmental things that are mandated down. If you have the ability in the code, in the contracts to enforce any sort of censorship, it will always happen. And there are a ton of reasons why as application developers that you don't want this, right? So uh, one is the ability to reorder transactions. So already there's, there's MEV that sort of like exists in every system. You have submit a transaction, there's a mempool, there's value that can be extracted there. And that's chain specific. You're not gonna change that. You're not going to basically reduce that surface significantly. What you don't want when thinking cross chain is you don't wanna add to that surface. So any set of validators, and again, Every single messaging protocol in the world, except one right now, I won't say which one, but um, every, every, uh, every protocol in the world right now has the ability to do this, which is like really important. They have the ability to reorder transactions in the middle, which means there's no guaranteed delivery of transactions, but it also means like, if you think about what high frequency trading has done to traditional markets, great. You see a, a trade pop up here, and then you race that person to another market to, to, to take the value, to front run them. This is, you now own the layer of how messages get delivered. And instead of just like trying to beat them, you can literally reorder them all so that you can exploit the maximum amount of value based on the order that they're submitted, uh, which is in a unbelievably large surface of value that can be extracted on top of the on-chain MEV. And so now like that itself, like you very much want non-sorter enforcement. One, because of the financial constraints. If you're doing anything that's a financial application, there is a, a huge amount of value that will be extracted from all of these messages from being reordered. And lots of, lots of these protocols are even moving in the direction of that being like part of the protocol, like flashbots for cross-chain stuff, but, but it's at the, the messaging layer in the middle. But it also means that there is the ability to, to censor transactions. There is the ability to take a governance vote that's going across. Uh, and you can think if you're ever building a system for votes um, within, within an electoral system, right, within any political system, the ability to, uh, e even just the possibility of, of losing votes, the possibility of removing a vote that you don't want, you can see how quickly perverted that could become and like what that could devolve into and any ability to censor not only like will likely be exploited but will be forced to be enacted so i think censorship resistance at its core is incredibly important this again goes back to immutable immutable contracts right you deploy uniswap um and for some reason, the government at some point in time, uh, you know, the government of Belgium says uh, no more dog coins. Like dog coins are outlawed. You, you can't put them in there. Like Uniswap can't change that code. There's nothing that they can do. The next version might have something, but like the system that is built and is constructed in a way that, that sort of aligns with the ideological world of, of the system that was being created cannot be perverted sort of later on uh, down the line. Uh, which again, I, I think is like incredibly important because without that, things will get very, very restricted very fast. And like, obviously, as you're building the systems, you need to build them in such a way that complies with current standards at a, at a global scale always. I think it's an increasingly uh, sort of like complex surface to consider. Um, but if you leave it open to, again, the ability to change the way that it functions, it's going to drastically change how, how people interact with that. And so once again, without immutability, censorship resistance is, is never guaranteed. If you can add it in later, somebody will add it in. If you can enforce censorship, it will always be enforced at some point in time. Um, so we'll go to the, the bulk of the conversation, which is really like building a better system. So as you build, and this up there is like our method to do this, but, but how do you build a system that is immutable, is permissionless, is censorship resistant, and how do you not get stuck in all of these uh, sort of like local quagmires? So like one of the trade-offs that you guys were talking about with Naz and Riaz is like, what happens if something bad happens, right? The ability to pause a contract, the ability to, to change state over time. Like how can you live in a line that gives users some form of protection, but also gives users protection from you? Like ultimately, 
if you're building a protocol and not building a service, right? If you're building a service, you're, you're a service provider. It's great. There's lots of services we all use every day. If you're building a protocol, the underlying user or application developer who's building on top of you should not, like, if you disappear, if you go away, if for some, something happens to you in the team, like, that protocol should still exist. The inventor of TCP IP, you know, doesn't change the current state of TCP IP. It exists. It's a protocol. It's used at scale. It's adopted. Uh, if you are intentionally malicious and as adversarial as humanly possible, the underlying user shouldn't need to care that much. Like, if the Uniswap devs uh, decided all they wanted to do was try to harm the users of Uniswap, there is nothing that they can do. Literally, I mean, they can turn on the fee switch, right? That is the surface of control that, that Uniswap has, is they can add an extra five bips uh, on a fee switch there. And like, that is incredibly important because if you want to get adoption, you can't leave that surface there. And so, at the same time, it's completely at odds with something bad is happening in Nomad and I want it to stop, right? Can somebody please save this? And so uh, I think you have people on both ends of the spectrum. Uniswap is, if there was a bug in Uniswap, there's nothing that can be done, right? It's completely immutable. There is nobody who can pause it. There's nobody who can save the LPs. It's a piece of code that is meant to stand the test of time. Um, and if something is wrong, it's gonna be a race between LPs getting out and people exploiting that. Like, that's just the fact of the case. But that has allowed Uniswap to become as, as incredibly successful as it has. So how we think about it internally, and one thing that I think is an interesting trade. Time locks, there's a couple of things you can do to like, okay, this can change, but everybody has some heads up and can opt out of the system while this is changing. So that was kind of like the first surface of like, we can upgrade code, but you're gonna have a seven day heads up, so feel free to flee if you want. Now. That's probably fine, you know, maybe that's fine for something like a DEX, like a Uniswap where, um, okay, seven days, I can, I can remove my LP, I've heard about this, great. If you're a messaging protocol and somebody has built their entire business on top of you, uh, their protocol is like, they need to shut down their protocol and flee, redeploy, like do something. Like it's catastrophically bad to have that. So the way that we thought about when doing this is basically having an append-only library of validation libraries. The bet that we were making as we were building is, listen, we want to get this part right of what this protocol looks like, the IP, right, the TCP IP structure. Like, what does messaging look like? What does the protocol look like? What we're not convicted on is whether or not it'll be Ethernet or broadband or Wi-Fi or all the things in the bottom half of, uh, of Ali's funnel there, right? And so for us, that's the validation library. For us, we said, this, you know, Whatever exists right now in the state of validation library is very, very unlikely to be de facto five to 10 years from now. Like, almost certainly will not be. And there's unbelievable amounts of research happening with zero knowledge proofs, with like all of these advancements in the validation technology. And so what we did is you make validation libraries published. We have about five published right now. You can always publish new ones, but you can never modify old ones, and you can never make people uh, force them to move off of an old one. So what it gives is every application the ability to opt in to existing sets of contracts. The so security is static if you've chosen it to be static, but it allows the protocol to innovate and continue to push features. So the, you're starting to see more and more systems start to walk a line like this, where it's, there is some form of proxy, there is some form of the ability to add a surface but it is entirely opt-in and it cannot affect prior applications. And I think that is like an incredibly important, incredibly important thing to think about as you're building your protocols and as you think about doing this, like you don't necessarily want to build something that you know will 100% be the case. So there's, there's two sides. There's Uniswap, which is V1, V2, V3. We're going to launch an entirely new protocol every single time we develop something new everybody will need to migrate, move to a new system, and the old system is dead. And again, for LPs, that's like not really that hard to do. It's not really that bad of a system, and it can function. For a messaging protocol, when you're thinking about what you're building on top of, you are like very anchored there, because if you have the ability to easily change messaging protocols, you can simply point it to yourself and rug everybody, right? Like it's, it's, the application has that ability, then the user is basically absorbing the risk of the application security parameters, basically. If the application can change from protocol A to protocol B of the messaging layer, you just spin up, some, you know, spin up something malicious of whatever multi-sig it is to control, point to your own messaging layer and say, yep, I definitely put a billion there, give me the you know, full billion on this side. And so 
you want the ability to add feature sets, but you don't want the ability to basically make that possible because the user won't bear it. And again, this is not like, you should think about it in a way of like, yes, this is a good, like this is how you should build systems. These are how should like, but even from the most greedy possible internal perspective, like if you look at everything that has gotten massive adoption in the space, everything that's been built on chain with that, as soon as you have that risk to the underlying user, the relationship changes completely. So again, you look at Uniswap, you look at Aave, you look at Ethereum, you look at all of these. All of these are built in these same exact principles. All of them are structured in the same exact manner. And I think like as you're evaluating which cross-chain protocol to use, like this is the framework you should use for evaluation. And I think most, as you look, the big flags you will see is upgradable contracts. The ability to upgrade contracts means your security is, is completely non-static and will be changing frequently in the future if the pace of upgrades right now is sort of existing. Um, permissionlessness, if it is a whitelisted set, again, there's, there's always, um, so there were, there were two things on the Nomad side. One, the watchers are whitelisted. Two, actually the person who pushes the updates um, for like actually posting the root was completely whitelisted as well. So you have like in, in non-permissionless sets, you have severe liveness issues, um, and then you have also like security issues. And then third is, is censorship resistance. Again, if you're if you're doing something that has any surface of of again governance is like a very good example, but a bunch of other cases. If you can censor transactions, if you can reorder transactions, it will be done, and it is already being done. Um, in the background, but soon to be in the foreground. Again, this is something like people are, are openly adopting uh, in the way that some modern protocols are kind of openly adopting MEV extraction at the at them pool level being commoditized into, uh, into the protocol. So um, happy to answer any questions anybody has. In the cross-chain uh, bridging architecture, how do you mitigate the risk of the off-chain components of bridging in addition to the immutable contracts? Yep, no, I, th I think it's a great question. So. Um, Okay, we actually changed our stance around this a lot. When we first launched our paper, uh, we basically said trustless messaging protocol, right? Uh, our stance was that from the application level, you could achieve true trust trustlessness by the following method. Basically, um, some transaction happens on source, you break apart that state into, into two pieces, sort of block header and receipts root. You move this state across, some parties, it can be you know X number of parties move this state across, it's reassembled, Merkle inclusion proof happens on the destination chain, validated messages passed to contract. If you give the application the ability to opt in to running one of those components themselves, so again, completely open and permissionless system. If you're an application, if you're a Uniswap and you're doing cross-chain transactions, if you run just one of those components yourself, you now have complete veto rights. So no malicious transaction can ever go through unless you sign off on it. So you have 100% veto right. Even if every other validator in the network is completely malicious, you are safe. Uh, and at the same time, if you are compromised, if your off-chain infrastructure is compromised, you're backstopped by the rest of the network, right? So that was a way that we thought about it and like, okay, this is, this is how you, in application building, would want to structure trustlessness. What we didn't consider at the time is that the user does not inherit that same set of trustlessness, right? This is trustless at the application level, but the user using it now trusts the application. So fast forward two and a half years of, of thinking about literally nothing but this. Um, I am 100% convicted um, in the fact that there is, there is no true trustlessness in any system, in any messaging protocol. And this includes, um, you know, another sidebar we can have is, is talking about like a, a lot of the forefront right now is the research in, in like zero knowledge proofing and, and messaging, like how that actually affects. And I, I think it's an extremely interesting topic and in how, how that structure is and actually the, the lack of trustlessness in it and sort of like how misunderstood it is. But, um, there are things that you can do to reduce the surface. So one thing that ZK stuff does that, that's really good is it reduces the, the surface of where the attack can come from. So you have a, a pure open MPC system. Um, you know, basically you have some amount of economic stake. The value that's being transacted or exposed can never exceed that economic stake, right? Or the, that, then, then you just sibyl it and you basically uh, collude to, to exploit the network. So like that is the overall risk. By zero knowledge stuff, you reduce the set of bad actors to now they are the Ethereum validators um, and they're a part of the sync committee. So now there's like a, a limited set and it's because Ethereum is so broad and decentralized, it's harder to get a set of those willing to collude 
My counter argument is like Flashbots is, is literally large scale validator collusion in production at like 60 to 70%. Um, so you reduce the surface of that. So you can do some things to make it limit who the bad actors are, but it still doesn't change the underlying risk. So there will, there will always be some form of risk at the, at the off-chain level. Ultimately, you're mutating some state on a destination chain based on a belief state of source, and the destination chain has no observability into true canonical state on source. So, you know, in a proof of work system, it's easy, right? You, you, there's a fork, and you're frozen at a point in time, and you just grab a block. It doesn't matter which one, the uncle or what ends up being canonical. Like, at a certain point of time, they're both canonical, and the destination chain will never know which one actually was, right? So you can wait a certain amount of time, and you can measure block height, and you can do this, but you still have people who are, like, reporting these things. Um, when it comes to Ethereum transactions and, and state proofs, like, great, I can fork the chain, I can do some, mutate some state, do some transactions on that, and then take that and report it over there, right? And so this was kind of the whole premise of ZK stuff was, okay, now we'll, we'll make sure that the right people are signing the message or signing the message. Uh, so there are ways, again, that you can limit surface, but you'll never remove it completely. The best thing you can do is, is choose a validator set that either you have participation in, your stakeholders have participation in. So like one thing is, again, imagine Uniswap governance is going across chains, right? Um, Uniswap governance already has some, or I guess Aave governance is a little bit of a better, a little better, because Uniswap governance has limited control of what they can do, right? They can add and remove people and flip on the sweet B switch. Aave governance has the ability to uh, change risk parameters, which means if they mess it up, you basically can blow up the protocol, right? Um, so it's like very important, and the protocol already trusts that group of validators a ton, right? So now take those same people and say, okay, we're gonna do something cross-chain. How do we do this without extending the surface of risk at all, right? We have a surface of risk now. The goal is don't compound that by introducing a new surface of risk. So if that same set of validators ran one of these off-chain components, ran a cohort of like, okay, we're gonna run a little network of, of this, and the same people with the same economic stake are validating that, then that basically means you have the minimum viable security of exactly what you already have. And so that is like the best case suggestion, I would say, to minimize it. But uh, there, there is no way to eliminate it completely. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. It seems somewhat analogous to the sequencer problem with kind of rollups and like data availability. And I wonder if, you know, that distinction between ZK and, and Optimistic plays a role here where you could use fraud proofs or some other mechanism. Yeah, so, uh, okay, now we can get in there. This is a conversation I, I like to have. Um, in a rollup, one of the really nice things that you have, and what makes a rollup a rollup, is that you have a canonical contract that lives on Ethereum, right? There is a, a source of truth that lives on chain, and if you want to validate a fraud proof, you validate against that. Everything that's on the L2 is rumors. Uh, the, the canonical contract is the source of truth, and that is the only source of truth. And so anybody can submit to that. That maintains the total state, and if you're gonna run a fraud proof, you simply basically run an on-chain geth client and run it against that, and you can validate state. Um, now, the ZK stuff, the goal was, great, we're going to basically take the people who signed this block, and because they have economic incentive to sign the block canonically on Ethereum, then we will move the, they'll move the block over to the destination chain to roll up wherever this is going, and we can trust that that state is the same because otherwise they'll get slashed. So it has as much security as Ethereum has, right? That's, that's the theory of, of zero-knowledge messaging. The problem is what they can do with zero economic penalty is you can create a canonical block on source that is honest and valid. You create the correct block on Ethereum. At the same time, the validator set in secret amongst themselves creates a completely malicious block. They create a snark of that block. So the block is thrown away. Nobody sees it. You can't get slashed. You present the block to the destination chain. The destination chain has no idea which is the true canonical state. So they just accept this malicious block and now that uh, attack is basically affected, right? And so in all messaging, anything, so again, canonical contract, source of truth, lives there, great. Everything happening on the L2, rumors. Everything happening on other chains, rumors. There is somebody who needs to move that state and the person who can move the state can manipulate the state. You can reduce how many people can manipulate that state. You can make sure it is the same people who are validating on Ethereum or on whatever chain. Um, but you cannot remove their ability to do it. And that is only because the destination chain cannot read directly from source. It doesn't know canonical state. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian. That was fantastic.